Hello and welcome to the brand new Roker Report Lasses podcast in association with Sunderland Community Soup Kitchen and Her Game 2, the campaign against sexism and misogyny in football. You've just heard our new theme music, which is Science by the wonderful Sunderland band Big Fat Big, and you can find out more about them in the link in the podcast description. So this is a whole new show for Roker Report. It's dedicated unashamedly to women's football and to Sunderland AFC women as Everyone will have realised by now we take women's football really seriously at Roker Report and we want to give the lasses and the FA Women's Championship proper coverage. So in the past on Roker Report we've spoken to the likes of Beth Mead, uh, Jen O'Neill and we've been running the the lasses podcast live every week during the season on Twitter. We've had some great guests on that as well. But now we're going to be bringing you weekly podcasts during the regular season plus interviews with some of the legends of our club and current players. We're going to have special podcasts over the summer focusing on the Euros and the Lionesses and Sunderland's pre-season prep and all the transfer news. We'll also keep half an eye on the other teams in the North East, including our Tier 2 rivals up the river at Durham. We'll still be using Twitter spaces for some post-match stuff and chats with opposition fans across the FA Women's Championship next season. But I'm delighted to be joined on our first ever podcast by our resident scout, analyst, shirt collector, Asian women's football expert, nurse, and indeed Sunderland fan, Charlotte Patterson. Charlotte, what are you looking forward to most about the move over to having a proper podcast? What's that saying? Is it uh, jack of all trades, but master of none? <laughs> um, but yeah, this has been something we've thought about for a while as a team, with it being sort of part of our big push and plan to promote more of Sullen women in women's football in general. For some time now, we've been doing, obviously, weekly Twitter spaces, chatting about the lasses for people to listen into live, and it's resulted in some great success. It allows us to reach a wider audience. I myself, I'm an avid podcast listener, and I'll listen to episodes at any given moment, whether that's, you know, when I'm getting ready for work or, you know, driving in my car. Um, so I think it's helpful having everything in one place that's like easily accessible to people, um, particularly because I think if, you know, if you've missed a Twitter space, I'm sure you only have... 30 days after that's come out to to listen so it allows us to have everything all you know Sutherland ladies Sutherland women's football all in one place uh, people can go back through the archives of episodes if they they join us a, a little bit later so yeah it's exciting times definitely and we're also joined by Sunderland fan Eppleton regular soup kitchen volunteer and a very familiar voice on the Roker Rapport podcast over the years Ant Watson and For any listeners who um, might be new to the women's game and to the lasses, what for you makes SEFC women such a special team to follow? Quite a lot of things, to be honest, Rich. You know, the atmosphere when you go, it's always, you know, a family-friendly atmosphere. I've recently started taking my nephew there and he absolutely loves it. It's basically, I think, what I think Mel Ray said it a few times uh, over the course of the last few years. If you go once, you get hooked straight away. Um, you know the the team are just so like they just fight for each other. They fight for everything. They fight for the last the last second of every game. You know, and it it just summed up last last uh, last season actually on the on the last game where we were down when we were down two one and you know Jessica Brown goes and scores in the last couple of minutes. You know they never stop. Um, you know the and and all the girls as well. Um, even including the staff as well. They're just so friendly. Um, you know, you, you ask for anything and they'll give you, you know what I mean? Um, you know, autographs, you know, shirt signs, everything. And it's just a really, you know, really nice place to go on a Sunday afternoon, watch some really good football and just to, you know, enjoy yourself, really. Yeah, completely. Yeah, and I echo exactly what you said there about the commitment of the team. And it's something that we're going to cover in this podcast uh, where we're going to review the season 2021-22 that we, that's just finished. Just to give everyone a bit of context, really, about how we got to where we are as a club after being demoted from the WSL one because of well a combination of being abandoned by the uh, by the owners Ella Short and Mar- and Martin Bain and the FA's new rules, uh, we were we were kicked out of the WSL and we found ourselves for the first time I think in tier three um, and uh, we finished second to Blackburn in twenty eighteen nineteen. We then ran away with it in 2019-20 before first COVID cancellation, which actually in the records goes down as a null and void season. So none of the goals and none of the games in that actually existed in the records, which is which is disgraceful, really. There was no points per game used in that. Then in 2020-2021, that was cancelled again. 
But our overall record in those two seasons put us and Watford in pole position for promotion into uh, Tier 2, which was which was a team short, so there was two teams promoted at the beginning of this season. When Kirill Louis dreyfus became chairman of Sunderland AFC, an application was rushed in um, to join the FA Women's Championship, which is Tier 2, the old WSL 2. And there wasn't much time to prepare in the summer, but we did bring in uh, some real experienced players in terms of Charlotte Potts, Emma Kelly, Abby Joyce uh, were all brought back into the squad, all players who'd, who'd played for Sunderland previously at higher levels. The aim was to stay up. There was one relegation place to avoid. And Mel Ray and Steph Libby, they, they achieved that with their squad. And now there's a new strategy in place. The season has been described, I think, by Alex Clark in our, in our live podcast as a roller coaster. I think that was a really good description. But what we're going to do today is we're going to go through it in three sections, charting the up, the ups and the downs of the season. It really was an up and down season. And I think the three sections that we've chosen are really uh, indicative of that. The first part we're going to look at is the kind of the August, November, early season The first game of the season was away at Coventry United, who would become, I guess, the story of the the FA Women's Championship overall, uh, with their their, um, almost going out of business over Christmas, their kind of rising like a phoenix and and, and grabbing the the last remaining place in the league uh, in the very last seconds of their game against Watford on the last day. Um, But we, we played them away at Butts Park Arena, and it was it was a fantastic day. I think Katie described it as just a celebration of actually being back where we kind of belong. Uh, we spent a lot of time in Tier Two over the years, and to come away with that from that game with a win, but not just a win, a win against a team that was fully professional, a win where our players had really impressed their their commentator who who provided us commentary with the game. It was just a fantastic way to start the season. I think everyone was really nervous and we didn't know if we would be able to actually cope. It's a big jump coming from Tier 3 to Tier 2 in women's football. And we and we came through it. And so that was three points on the board straight away. And then Ant, we, 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 we played our first home game against Blackburn at the Stadium of Light and, and, and you were there. I nearly wasn't as well. <laughs> uh, I yeah. had a bit of an issue with my car. So my mate came and picked us up. Doesn't watch women's football at all, uh, and he does now after that game. Great. Yeah, I think both those games, Rich, we kind of like, I think what Katie says, it was, a, it was a celebration of being back to where we belong, but it was also a big stamp of that we're not here to make up the numbers. You know, like the Coventry away game, I thought we deserved to win more than 1-0. Uh, we eventually mm-hmm. got the goal through through Jess Brown. And then that game at the Stadium of Light, we just absolutely shot out the blocks. We, we were very, very good in that first half. Emily Scar got a goal um, after a mistake by, by their defence, but they were just shocked by how just with the pressing that we were doing on them. It was a really, really fun game. You know, we, we didn't look didn't look as if we were going to throw that away at all. You know, Blackburn came back into it in the second half, but we were really good. And by that time, we were top of the league and everyone was like, what? what's, gonna, what's going on here? You know, we knew that wasn't going to last, but we enjoyed it as, as it happened. You know, we were, um, it was a very, very good opening couple of games. And, and like I say, just showed everyone in that league that we were here to be reckoned with. Definitely. And then we went away, played in the Premier League stadium at uh, Crystal Palace, Selhurst Park, and got a, a one-all draw. So then a one-all draw and a bit of a scrappy game at, against Lewis at the Stadium of Light again. We then had, had two losses against two really, really strong teams, two of the strongest teams in the league. A 2-1 loss away at Bristol where we certainly didn't disgrace ourselves. And and then our local rivals came down the A690 Durham and, and took a 2-0 win at Elton in front of a, what was a really good crowd, a mixed crowd of Sunderland and, and Durham fans, which was really nice to see. So it was two wins, two draws and two losses. And then we we had a Conti Cup game, Charlotte. And and I think this is, um, you know, the Conti Cup is the League Cup in, in women's football. It's always been reorganised. It's never quite settled on a format and it's a bit of a strange one. We came out with a, a one-all draw, but we got we got two points for that because we won on penalties. Do you think that was a really important game in our season to go to somewhere like Sheffield United and 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 show again like in the cup competitions that we were actually going to be competitive this season? Yeah, I definitely think so, especially given the fact that um you know the lasses had put such a good performance in against Durham um in the the league game um and obviously you know losing the derbies 
always a tough one to take and I think you know we were the better side until you know it was just two really good goals from Durham that took us out of that so I think the the lasses you know headed into this fixture trying to kind of rectify that um although saying that you know Mel very much went for a change side I mean we had no Charlotte Potts or Grace McCatty in this fixture we had quite a lot of players that were playing out position I think Emma Kelly was playing in right back if I remember and you had Scar and Ferruja who were playing in midfield as opposed to being sort of up top um but then you also had saw you know our first glimpse of, of Grace Seed from the Sutherland Regional Talent Centre mm-hmm. you know coming on and having her first minutes um but it was one of those games where I think it was, you know, it was very, not necessarily end to end, but, um, you know, both sides had good chances. But I think just at the end of the day, another could be too clinical in front of goal. I mean, I'd say Sheffield had more possession and their passing was a lot better than ours. But, you know, it was um, Sweetman Kirk who obviously made it 1-0, I think, in the 53rd minute. Um, and then after that, you know, it was kind of the lasses trying to fight to get back into the game. And you know we were pressing really hard and um, we got sort of our rewards for that in the the final sort of moments when uh, there was a handball at the box and we were awarded a penalty and then up steps you know captain Kira Ramshaw and calmly slots it away to take us to penalties Um, and then just from there I just think that the momentum shifted and that there was that belief that we could go on and, and see the game out and yeah like you mentioned we won 4-2 on penalties I'm sure it was Kelly Heron and Scar you know converting their their penalty kicks and yeah it was just it was a fantastic game and like you said I think after you know we had you know a couple of draws a couple of losses so it was good to sort of get a win you know back on the cards for the lasses because uh you know they, they had another tough couple of rounds of playing away but you know we'll we'll chat onto them later but I think it really did sort of kick start the, the lasses you know form a little bit again yeah definitely it it it, w- it was great as well and and again we had traveling support we had Katie was there and her dad and then they all, everyone went mad when we when we scored and when we won and and the pictures I think from that game I think we'll we'll probably use them as the pod art for for this first launch pod because they are absolutely uh, wonderful seeing the 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 looks on the faces of the of the team when that kind of final penalty went in we won the tie and I mean for me it's just a shame that you don't get three points for a, for a, a penalties win in the Conti Cup because we would have progressed as well and we will come on to that um, in in a bit but as Charlotte mentioned we went then had two away games uh, Charlton Athletic away which I think Alex picked out as, as his highlight of the season just to go away to a, a, a club again that had been reasonably established at this level and picking up three points against a, a professional team the, the fully pro uh, side and then another County Cup win away at Blackburn on the ploughed field at Bamber Bridge, which uh, again must have given them loads of confidence. And but then November kind of cold weather struck, long journeys start to strike. Charlotte and London City Lionesses, who I think used to be part of Millwall Football Club, uh, broke away and now funded by a crypto currency billionaire and his wife. Um, very few fans, it seems, but a fully professional squad and a, and a lovely shirt. And I know you like your shirts. That was, it, I think, a game where Sunderland fans thought we might stand a chance given the, the form we'd had. But we came away with a 2-0 loss um, and it started a, a pretty poor run of form. So what do you think happened in in that game that that shifted the momentum? Because if you look at the, the kind of the nine fixtures, including that, we really did go on on a bit of a slump. Yeah, it's a hard one to pinpoint because, um, you know, obviously we just talked about when we were playing in the, the cup game, obviously we were very experimental and given, you know, lots of sort of uh, younger and more inexperienced players that time out and we put in such a good performance. Yet in this game, we actually had all of our regulars back in the side, um, but London City were just so quick out the blocks. I mean, they made it 1-0 after to five minutes and I think just after that, we just really struggled to find our rhythm. Um, I'm sure London City could have made it, you know, two or three nil before the half time, but you had the likes of Grace McCatty who was putting in an excellent performance and the defence that were putting in an excellent performance. And I just, I just don't think they could kind of get their, you know, fair share of possession really. I think the mid- midfield really struggled with sort of the overload that, you know, the London City like to play with. I think as well we were on the receiving end of some bad calls from the referee. It was, you know, kind of the 
I'm sure it was in the second half where, you know, Neve Herring gets fouled in the box and we should have had a penalty and yet the you know, the referee waved it away. And then later in the game, Emily Scars kind of threw in on goal and their defender comes out and, you know, basically takes her out and it you know, it's um a denial of a goal scoring opportunity, but the referee gives it a yellow card instead of a red. So I mean I'm not gonna solely blame, you know, the the loss on the referee, but it certainly didn't make things easier and I, I think it just kind of already added to the the lasses' feelings of frustration for the the sort of the afternoon, um, and just yeah, I mean in the the second half, obviously you know London got the the second goal, you know right in the final moments of the game, and I just think it was a spirited performance, but it just wasn't our day. I mean London are a very good side, um, like you touched on before, you know they've had a lot of financial backing, they're a professional team, and I just think we really struggled to to cope with that, um, and you know like we're going to be probably touching on it just that sort of the game itself just seemed to have a huge impact on the lasses and their sort of the way that they performed really for the next couple of games I mean it's never for a lack of effort or spirit it just for whatever reason it just from there just never clicked for us for a long time yeah certainly the the case and and we went we went away to Watford and uh, managed to get a, a draw but most teams have have beaten Watford reasonably comfortably this season which and for me that one was was a disappointment as well and then we had a series of kind of of, of it was getting colder the nights were drawing in the weather was getting bad we had a loss in the league and then a loss in in the cup the loss in the league to Liverpool and then a a, a bit of a scudding off Villa in the Conti Cup we got a 1-0 uh, win away against uh, Brighouse in the FA Cup but then we had one of the, the 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 best evenings of the of the year. One that I think won our moment of the year when when Neve Heron cleared off the line in in Sunderland's nil um, nil County Cup draw and win on penalties against the eventual champions of Tier Two, Liverpool. And talk us through your experience of that game because I, I think that's one I think that will live long in the memory, won't it? I think so, yeah. To be honest, I think all three games against Liverpool, we've we've held our own, and all. It, it sounds silly with the results being like three one and three nil in the league, and it sounds as if it was a lot more comfortable for Liverpool, but it wasn't, you know. And um, yeah, that that cup game, we were we just defended so like like heroically, really, you know. Um, Potsy had had a really really good game, you know. She was she was fantastic. Mm-hmm. Nave Heron with one of the best goal line claims as I've ever seen, you know, literally I have mentioned it loads of times on our Twitter space, but she she knew she was gonna get hurt and and did, to be honest. She she eventually got back up, <laughs> but uh but we had our chances as well, you know, Maria went through a couple of times and um their standing goalkeeper made a couple of really good saves and then like I say goes on to penalties and I just always thought we were gonna win. You know, you know when you get that feeling that you're gonna. It, mm-hmm. it doesn't happen often. What being a Sun fan and an England fan, you know, it doesn't happen often. Think you're gonna win a shootout. <laughs> but this one, I just, I just thought we're gonna, we're gonna win. And we missed our first one. I think Keys missed the first one. But we, every penalty from then on was excellent, you know. And the one who missed for Liverpool was was Fernie, and uh, she at the post to give Maria a chance to 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 win. To win the game and and she did fantastic. I thought I think I think Claudia was in goal for that one for us and, and made some very good saves in the in the ninety minutes. Um, yeah, it was just one of those games where you were like if you if you were a, a neutral watching this watching both sides, you would think they're both at the top. Uh, whereas you know Liverpool were starting to run away with it from then on, but uh, we were we were excellent. It was one of them games where I thought this is going to turn around our season. I think that proved to be the case. To be honest, that that game was the catalyst of. That we know what what we can do, and we don't fear anybody in this league. Um, that was probably the the bit of a turnaround because the form from you know leading in that game, especially that Villa game, where yeah, Villa put a good side up, but we were we were pretty poor. Um, you know, we conceded a goal within about twenty seconds, and it just never it just never got any better. It was it wasn't a great game to watch, and it was absolutely pouring down when we were in, so it wasn't a nice game to be at. But um, but yeah, that Liverpool one, we kind of and as you said there. Had had it be three points for a win, we would have qualified on that game, uh, which I'm yeah. not sure would have been great for us. To be honest, I'm I'm glad we didn't qualify, and I'm, I think Mel said exactly the same thing where they, they were there to they used that county cup to to bleed in the likes of Grace Aid, you know, give Holly Manders a run, um, you know, I think Holly played all them games and and then shown progress because of that. So it was a, it was a fantastic night. It was cold, but it was a fantastic night to be to be there. I've got my views about 
cup competitions and and whether there needs to be a, a competition that women's championship teams are actually able to win uh, so that you know fans have got more to cheer that there's more opportunities for players to experience you know semi-finals and finals of cup competitions because um, having the Conti Cup format where you've got the Champions League clubs coming into it at the quarter-final stage it does make a bit of a mockery of the early rounds and and uh, although you might get a, if you do get through you might get a big tie against a, a Manchester United or a Manchester City or a Arsenal or a, a Chelsea you, you're doing an awful lot of effort to not get much reward because there's no prize money in that either Talking about an awful lot of effort for not much reward. There's two, then two very, very long trips away to London City and to Lewis to come away with a 3-1 and a 2-0 defeat to knock us back again in the league. I think at that point we hadn't won in the league you know, since that game against Charlton. Um, so we went away to Birmingham in the FA Cup as a bit of a break from from the league and and the way it was going uh, at the end of January we we were in the fourth round of the FA Cup against Birmingham at St Andrews and for me this is probably my favorite game of the season to go to uh, along with Liverpool a couple of weeks later um away but it showed although we lost 2-1 in extra time it showed that the lasses really were up to competing with WSL teams we gave them a really hard game i think we scared them I don't think they were expecting Sunderland to be quite as strong as we were. Obviously, Birmingham had a really difficult time of it in the WSL, but I think they'd beaten Arsenal not that long before that. And obviously, that was one of the, probably the, the result of the season in the WSL and may ultimately have been the, the game that decided the title in the WSL. So we, we held our own against Birmingham and we scored our goal uh, late in the game, after Claudia Moan this time had been heroic, saving all sorts of shots, close range, long range, fantastic dives, tipping over the bar. She was uh, really on form uh, in that game. And then they messed up at the back, and it was always going to be a mistake that got us back in the game. We were putting them under a lot of pressure. There was a, a back pass that the goalkeeper missed. It was a misjudged back pass. The goalkeeper uh, scrambled back grabbed the ball on the line and we got an indirect free kick. Kiwi Ramshaw runs up, uh, well, steps up. The ball's nudged to her by uh, Neve Heron and she blasts the ball low into the bottom corner of the goal and it was it was lovely to be amongst kind of all the Sunderland fans and the, and the players' families when that went in because it erupted a little bit. It was a really good atmosphere that day and even though um, eventually Birmingham did get that that second goal. I think, and having talked to some of the players about it, that game in particular was, along with probably the Liverpool game, one where they could look and say, you know, this is, we're, we're able to perform at this level, at this WSL level, essentially, when we're on our game. So so that was a, a fantastic one. And then going away to Liverpool, and as, as you said, the games against Liverpool have been amazing. That one, again, I was at, we didn't deserve to lose 3-0. They were a really, really good side, and they thoroughly deserved to win the to win the league. But I don't think they deserve to win that game three 0 And we had the uh, the penalty and red card incident, which uh, people can go on our TikTok and see a video of and and see just how soft that was. It was it was awful. And what what did you make of the kind of the Birmingham Liverpool games and and, and the boost that they gave the lasses uh, going into the kind of the the latter part of the of the season? Yeah, I mean, considering, you know, as as you've just mentioned there, we had two horrible games at the start of the year where I think the travelling probably took it out of them, especially the Lewis game. Yeah. But they'd also lost Potsy and, you know, they have to, you know, have to rejig a little bit. You know, we didn't make any signings in, in the January transfer window. You know, we brought in Grace Boys from, from the RTC and also Abby Towers, but this was before Abby would started playing anyway. So we were like, we were down two defenders because Grace McCatty got sent off against Lewis Stinchy um for you know a typical Grace McCarty tackle <laughs> but she didn't get the ball. But yeah, uh that Liverpool game especially the first half we should have been two or three nil up. If it wasn't for Rachel Laws, we would have been in that game. I know Liverpool had a couple of penalty shouts, which one probably was a penalty, but we were excellent in that game. You know, even yeah even when we went down to ten women, you know, we we were we were still playing well. You know, that that decision <laughs> is amongst many of decisions that we've 
really, you know, being under the wrong end of this year. You know, we lost that game, but we got a lot of confidence from it, uh, even though we lost Neve Heron. And it set us up for kind of getting back into form, didn't it? It did, yeah. Yeah, That that's probably the game where you look at where we did turn it around. You know, we probably should have got something from Birmingham. We probably should have got something from Liverpool and we didn't. I mean, I think, I think what they did, they, they took that on, played... I think it was Chef United at home after that one and drew two two, took the lead twice. One of the best goals of that the season. one was that one was just before, but I think that one, you know, it can definitely be put alongside the Liverpool one of giving the Lords of confidence. Yeah, yeah we 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 two two draw at Ebbleton against Sheffield United. Yeah, sorry, I've got mixed up with the Palace game. I apologize. That's all right. <laughs> but yeah, I mean the, the Palace game, uh, Abbey Towers come in and what Abbey done was straight away sort of that defensive that defensive line out where we were putting Neve there where, you know, we've said all season Neve's a midfielder. Um it allowed us to put Neve back in midfield. It allowed us mm-hmm. not to play Louise or Megan centre halves, you know, they're both they're both, you know, right backs or left backs. You know, Megan will play anywhere across that back. She's fantastic, but she's more of a right back. And mm-hmm. what Abby Towers did, I thought, for for you know, we never saw that many games. She only played six games or something like that, but she was just fantastic. Like a seventeen year old girl who's just come out of nowhere, really. You know, she was an RTC, she went to Burra for a few games and all that, you know, had half a season at Burra. And the way she came in and just adapted herself to to um championship football was tremendous and you know, that girl's got a massive future. I know she's picked up a horrible injury, but I think she'll be back. I think she'll She'll just thrive, I think, next year um, once she comes back. But yeah, it it gave us that little bit of confidence back that you know we were we we did miss Neve in that game, but we came we came back. We we gave a good go. We probably should have won the game. I know we were all there. We, we again another for me a ridiculous referee in performance. Um, mm-hmm. not just for the goal, but just for everything. You know, we probably should have had a penalty early on. We definitely should have had a penalty late on in the game, and it it it, it kind of. It kind of shown we weren't getting the rub of the green, but the re- the results were going to come, and you know, and they did eventually. You know, um, as 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 we're going into the you know the the Sheffield United away game, they, the 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 started to turn. You know, as soon as they got you know the Garby Towers in there, they got Neve Heron back playing in the middle of midfield, and then what they should they should have went to Blackburn, they should have won. You know, that was a poor performance. Obviously, Kieran missed a mm-hmm. penalty on the in the last kick. We did probably deserve to draw out of that game. It was two sides. Blackburn were poor. We played poor. But then that that Sheffield United game was a tremendous game for a lot of reasons. You know, we we went there and you know secured our position in the championship for next season. You know, we went out there and even though we went one nil down, all the girls there were fantastic. You know, we scored two brilliant goals. Um, on this on the stroke of half time, you know, Emily Scar scores a fantastic goal, and then. A really, really nice team move resulted in her breaking through and scoring, and then Maria Ferrugia scored probably the best goal of the season. It got it got voted the best goal of the season, didn't it? On our mm-hmm. um, on our little awards, where you know, lovely ball over top by Neve, and she goes and and chips it over the goalkeeper, um, and then obviously the famous me and Katie moment where I thought Jack Lever had scored and it was Emma Kelly, um, <laughs> <laughs> but even that, you know, and and after that, you know, we we stopped for quite a while after the game, and how. How happy all of them were, you know. This was without Kira as well, who who uh, got COVID during the week, and just how happy they all were that they'd managed to secure that 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 championship football for next year. And I think from after that, they played with a fair bit of all the pressure was off. You know, they played with a bit of freedom from that game. I think that game was was yeah. the game where they thought, right, sod it, we're just going to go out, we're going to play with a bit of freedom, a bit of passion. And they were absolutely, you know, to a girl, they were all absolutely magnificent. You know, I remember doing the ratings after the game and I was like, I could give them all tens. You know, there wasn't a bad performance amongst all of them. They were fantastic. Yeah, and uh, certainly. And just kind of following along uh, with the game, it did seem that we we put them put them to the sword in the end. And we were so clinical when you look at the highlights. It was fantastic. And then, then we had two games against the bottom two. Both at home, we we beat Watford uh, reasonably comfortably, two one, and then drew with the resurgent Coventry United, who, who I think in the end were were well deserving of not going down, having been docked ten points. They were they were definitely they were on their un, unbeaten run at that point, and they they managed to get themselves hold themselves back up, and 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 a point at Sunderland was 
was crucial for them. But by this time, it wasn't crucial for us, and 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 so good on them for getting that. We then had our away day in uh, in Durham, which I think we we'll uh, we'll skip over. Cause, <laughs> uh, I, th- I, th- I think me, I think me and Ant are still quite angry about the like that. Just that game just didn't. It, we never got going. But Charlotte, a game you went to at Ebble, and f- last game of the season, uh, Bristol City. Obviously, again, the professionals of Bristol City with some fantastic players, leading scorer, Avi Harrison, uh, you know, uh, some 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 brilliant players across the park. And we did ourselves well proud in that, didn't we? Um, to, to come out with a 2-2 draw. It was a, a fantastic and like just really well-rounded spirited performance. I mean, you know, all the players played well individually and as a team. I mean, I know obviously the sort of doing the the match ratings after it was it was so hard to kind of pick one person that stood out because everybody had a good game you know right across the board um you know we opened up the score and you know fairly early on I think it was the 14th minute we won a free kick and Emma Kelly who's been brilliant on sort of set pieces you know whether it's taking corners or taking free kicks sends one into the box the goalkeeper parries it but it goes straight on to Kira who just heads it home and that's one nil already and then after that, we had the opportunity to, you know, even score a couple of more. We, you know, we just we really took the game to them, you know, considering the type of side that Bristol are. And at that point, you know, they were trying to sort of get the, the runners up, I suppose, in the championship because London City mm-hmm. were you know, battling it out as well. Um, So they wanted to finish the season out on a high. And given sort of the attacking prowess that they have I think we just we really stunted that by just playing some brilliant football similar to like how we've performed all season you know we've never necessarily dominated in terms of possession or passing stats but it's always about what we've done with the ball and I think we were just excellent every time we're on the ball you know we played some wonderful sort of ticky tack of football you know like one touch stuff out on the wings and it was just a brilliant performance and obviously we went in uh, at half time and it was one nil but kind of after that we saw that Bristol came into the game a little bit more they seemed to want it you know they made it 1-1 through Johnson you know shortly after half time and then they made it 2-1, you know, a couple of minutes after that, even though Alison Cowlin had had a brilliant game up at that point. And she made a fantastic initial first save. It's just unfortunate the save ended up rebounding, um, you know, straight at the foot of Morgan, who just put, put it away. Um, But it would have been so easy for the lasses to just kind of, you know, just take it. You know, it's the last game of the season, you know, it doesn't matter, we're safe. We, we, we could just leave it like this. But they didn't, you know, they still had that spirit mm-hmm. and, you know, Mel made some brilliant, um, you know, tactical decisions. She brought on Holly Manders and she brought on uh, Jess Brown and they just really added to the game. I think that them two, Emma Kelly and um, Emily Scar, just linked up so, so well, particularly out on that left wing. And, and, and we saw that, you know, for the second goal um, to make it 2-2. Uh, it started off with Emma Kelly, who, you know, sent in a long ball forward. Then Emma um, Emily Scar sort of headed it down. Um and then I think it was Holly Manders who ran with it along the wing, went back to Emily Scar, she crosses it in and then boom, header by Brown and it's absolutely, you know, just fantastic scenes. I mean, I was sat um in the stand at Eppleton and so I had a really great view of the goal and the celebrations after and it just you could just see how hard they work for it and, you know, just that true grit and determination that they've shown all season that, you know, even when sort of the you know, the backs have been against a corner and we haven't had you know, like we've touched on the greatest look in terms of whether it's referees or players leaving or injuries and suspensions that we just kept fighting right the way at the end. And I mean, right into the final moments, you know, we could have won the game Um, when, you know, Holly Mandis was through on goal. Um, But I mean, at the end of the day, it was a brilliant save by the Bristol goalkeeper uh, to keep it out and to make sure that both teams went away with the point. But yeah, it just capitalised off sort of a really good run of form from the lasses, you know, like we touched on before, it was after that sort of um that Liverpool game we just really started to to hit some form and get going um and yeah I mean at, at the end of the day the lasses could be really proud in the performances that they've put in in the season and I think that sort of draw against Bristol just really highlighted that definitely um I, I absolutely think right and and I think it's it's it, you're absolutely right to highlight Mel and Steph's tactical prowess really on the touchline because they did set up the team in each game almost a bit like how Alex Neal is for the men, you know, a, a bit like horses for courses with with a with a, a definite game plan and a definite way that they wanted to approach each, each opponent that we've faced this season. 
and that was the last game of the season. It was it was live streamed, which is something that the club are going to do next season with commentary. We also had the the Radio Newcastle team there as well, and hopefully uh, Radio Newcastle are going to do more women's football coverage over the next twelve months as well. So it's that's that was really good to see. But our overall record, I think, just to just to run through it quickly, we finished ninth of twelve in the 22 games in the league we got six wins six draws and 10 defeats 23 goals four and 32 against we picked up therefore 1.1 points per game around about a goal a game and we conceded uh, 1.45 goals per game so a, a good season of consolidation for Sunderland and but um what did you make having watched a lot of it live um what did you make of the quality of the FA Women's Championship it's not a level that we've played at since the mid kind of 2010s really when we were dominating tier 2 what 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 did you think about the league overall it's been described as as, as ridiculously competitive yeah it is and it's only going to get more competitive next season with obviously Birmingham coming down and uh, one of Wolves or Southampton come up who are, are both good sides so mm-hmm. it's it's going to get even more competitive you know what 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 we can take from it really is you know, we didn't score enough goals you know we we create mm-hmm. a lot of chances and you know giving a an out and out striker and I don't mean to be you know horrible to Maria or anything like that but she's not an out and out striker you know she's perfect in a 10 or out wide but then she did really well uh when she was called upon to play the lone role but for me when he when he's out and out strike if we'd had you know as, as we mentioned quite a lot if we had a Bridget Galloway on the pitch I think we might have scored a few more goals got a few more points mm-hmm. and got a little bit further in the league but when you look at the like the commentary where you know this is a professional side who yeah I know they went through what they went through and god we don't want that ever to happen to any other side in this league but take away their points deduction we still would have finished above Coventry. You know, that's yeah. what you got to take away from it, that we were never in any danger of getting relegated at all. So that's a massive success, considering the side's got an average age of 21. We've got, you know, 16-year-olds playing. We've got, you know, an 18-year-old in Neve Heron who it, it just complete... That's a first, you know, complete season. You know, she came on the scene in, in the COVID um, hit season that you described, Rich, where... You know, mm-hmm. that got cut short with about four or five games to go with us needing one point to go up. You know, but that's her first full season and she's got better and better as, as the season's gone on. You know, she's becoming more competitive and, you know, she's becoming a top, top player. And you take take next season into account where these have got a season on the backs, uh, especially the young girls who, you know, are still coming up. You know, they're still developing, they're still growing in, in their own bodies, you know. Give them another year in that in that kind of environment. I think they're going to thrive. But yeah, you know, we we don't score enough goals. We create a lot of chances, and we don't score enough goals. And you know, to, to really nitpick a little bit, we probably need to keep maybe a couple of more clean sheets. Um, you know, there's been a lot of set players where we have conceded a lot of goals from. Um, you know, and but I'm sure Mel and Steph will look at that at the end of the season through the data. And they'll uh, they'll be looking at improving that, you know, whether it's personnel or whether it's you know a different kind of way they they play. Yeah, I think I think that's that's, that's absolutely fair um, summation of 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 where the league is and where we are within the league. And um, so, Charlotte, I just want to ask you what your biggest positive from the season is for the for the lasses looking maybe looking at the 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 whole division and and again where where we are in comparison to the other teams what's your big takeaway in terms of the the the, the positive yeah i think it's something that we've we've touched on throughout uh the podcast is just that fight and and belief from the lasses i mean you know we've touched on sort of the fact that survival was the goal when we came in and I think we've just got to like really think about the situation that the lasses found themselves in. I mean, we only knew we were going to be competing in the championship a few weeks before it starts, so we couldn't get the preparation that all of the other teams had. We know sort of the the financial like situation at Sutherland that and a lot of what happens with us depends on how well the men's team do. So we haven't got those additional you know resources like other clubs have yet. Despite all of that, despite the hardships, despite, you know, the likes of Kira Ramshaw getting COVID and, you know, having a lot of personal circumstances off the pitch, despite the fact that, you know, Charlotte Potter left in the January, that we've had players out through injury or suspension, 
every time you know I can honestly say like hand on heart for, for almost all games of this season the lasses have always given 100% it might not have always worked out but they've always left everything on the pitch and I suppose that that's all you can ask for really as a fan um obviously everybody you, you want to win every game you go into but you don't mind losing as much if you, as long as you know that they've left everything out there and I can safely say that every time the lasses play they do exactly that um so that has to be sort of my big takeaway from the season you know the big positive and it, it spells sort of something you know really positive for the future as well because I think what Mel's creating here with this team and I'm sure we'll, we'll come into a little bit later but I mean you know we're relying on a lot of young girls coming through from the the RTC and you know we kind of have that that ethos that philosophy of like built not bought and you know these are you know local players um you know local girls that are from this area they know how much like these clubs mean to people and you know having them coming in your side and seeing that clear progression like pathway you know the likes of Gracie you know coming in and being able to adjust to senior football and she, she doesn't look anything out of place um at all um and yeah it's just it's just such a positive to take you know like I said despite all of those hardships that the lasses just always give the all every time I I, I agree and, and certainly that um that togetherness and the bringing through the young players is is my positive as well and I'm pretty sure and you would you would say um the same but and I want to ask you you know you've been quite close to what's been going on on and off the pitch uh, I want to ask you what what thing or player or aspect of this season that's maybe gone a little bit under the radar something that maybe we haven't talked about so much that you think's really important for for people listening and and Lassus fans in general to to kind of understand about about this this team and and what they've achieved I, th- I think Sean hit the nail on the head where they'll play anywhere you know like I think a, a, a girl who's been so underrated this year has been Emily Scar like She's still mm-hmm. only, you know, I think she's only 21 years of age. She's not a very old old girl at all, but she's been asked to do a job playing, you know, up top on the, on the wings and everything. You know, listen, she's so quick, you know, and she's, I think she's done a lot of bolt work for the team, you know, where mm-hmm. she's been asked, you know, to, to chase after, you know, lost causes when she's been playing up top because of her pace, um, you know, and listen, she got, an absolutely horrendous injury in uh, in the Watford game. You after you know four seconds of the game, you know she goes up and and takes a horrible you know a horrible head injury. You know, and I think a lot of a lot of fans and a lot of the players, you could see how serious it was so so early on because you know the last was barely moving. You know, it was it was it was horrendous. But the way she's like kind of come back from that. Um, you know, she came back. She she set up that really, you know, with um, Charles mentioned that well, the one for Jack out the final game of the season, you know, and she was probably our best player that game. You know, she just wouldn't give up, and and that's what that's what Charles mentioned before. None of these players give up. You know, you look at you look at Joycey who tunes around for ninety minutes. She must be absolutely shattered. Then you know, the, the, and and bearing in mind these girls have to work as well. You know, you've got mm-hmm. like you've got teachers. You've got you know, I think Joycey works on the trains. You know, so she's got to, you know, have, you know, you know, she's got to do some steps to the after at work. You know, we've got Meg B, who's, you know, a firefighter, you know, so, and they're taking, you know, they're, they're putting the bodies on the line for this team. It's just, they all just deserve so much credit, you know, for, for a season where we were written off, you know, at the start, you know, I think everybody said, well, Sunderland will go straight back down because they haven't got the, uh, the squad depth. They lost the, you know, arguably the best, certainly the best defender, the, arguably the best player in Potsy in January, you know, under a cloud, you know, and how, how they were going to recover from that. And they went and lost the two games after that and they looked, they mm-hmm. looked, you know, a shell of themselves in, in those two games. And then to come back from that, to take Liverpool all the way, to take Birmingham all the way. And then the big, the big game, which, which I think we've, we've, we've kind of skipped over was when we beat, um, I think it was Charlton at home, wasn't it? Or yeah, yeah, yeah Charlton 2-0 at home, was it? Where, where we were, under the cosh for the majority of the game and scored, Neve Heron scored twice and then Claudia's made some magnificent saves. To do that is just phenomenal and and they keep on surprising us, they keep on, you run out of superlatives about this side because they just keep on coming back and coming back and coming back Um, you know, despite what hits them during the season you know, and I think for next year there's just so much to build on, you know, I know what Alex said where we want to finish three positions higher every season. For me, next year, the, given the right mixture of 
players coming in. There's nothing to suggest me that we can't finish in the top half of that of that table, you know. And and for and for me, that's just incredible, you know. It really is. Yeah, I think I think that's a really good point actually, and and also you mentioned there uh, the performance of Claudia Morn, uh, and we've talked about Alison Callan as well. And my my under the radar thing I think is the fact that we've got two almost equally good goalkeepers, but as you know, Charlotte's profiled Alison on the website this week, and I, I spoke to Claudia earlier in the year f- for the website as well. And they've they've both got their their different attributes. They're not the same goalkeeper, and and the fact that they've they've come in and out of the side almost interchangeably. They, I think that is something that is really impressive that they can actually do that, and the team is able to play with either goalkeeper. And their their records are, are are really good, and you know their their save compilations. Again, I will keep plugging our videos on TikTok, but our, the TikTok videos of of the save compilations just show how they've been crucial parts of the team, and and just again shows that every player and every position has has stepped up. Shall I give you a chance to talk about maybe what's gone under the radar, but also what did you think of when we spoke to Alex Clark and the, and the strategy that he outlined. Yeah, I mean, it's it's certainly something obviously positive to look forward to. I mean, there's a lot of suggestions that, you know, because I I think for a while, you know, both as as fans and writers and, you know, people that followed the club, we always feel that Sullen women are, you know, an an afterthought really, which it's difficult when you have got the men's team in the situation they are in in the League One. But yeah, we've always just, you know, kind of felt, you know, neglected and a little bit left out. And I think obviously when Alex came on at the Twitter spaces, you know, we, we talked about a lot of different topics and things. But I think for me, you know, given the fact that, as I mentioned before, that we didn't have a lot of preparation ahead of the season, we can't necessarily be too critical of how sort of Sutherland are. But I've noticed a, a huge change since, you know, Alex has come in as the general manager in terms of especially social media presence, you know, the we're tweeting a lot more mm-hmm. there seems to be a lot more engagement online and you know one of the things that Alex spoke about that you know has me feeling quite positive for the future is obviously the development of the Sutherland under 23s side so that there's a clear pathway now for all of these incredible talented players that we have coming through the regional talent centers that you know there's sometimes it can be too much of a jump for them to join straight into a senior side so at least now with the development of the U23s, that they can go there, they can get that match experience and that there there is the ability for, you know, Mel and Steph to monitor their progress and see how they're doing. And, you know, we can then incorporate them into the senior squad, you know, especially in situations where I know earlier, around the January time, we were really struggling for depth. If you looked at sort of our team sheet in terms of substitutions, we'd only have, you know, whichever goalkeeper it was that wasn't picked and maybe one other person. So at least now as well, that helps you know add that depth and you know like what we were talking about before is that that ethos of kind of built not bought and obviously things will be determined on on the success of the men's you know hopefully if if we do win the the playoffs final uh, at the weekend that you know Sunderland are back in the championship they will see more investment throughout the entire club you know not just on the men's side um it's just a difficult one because I think as, as Sunderland fans you know we've had so many people come in and tell us like this is what we're going to do and you know, not acted upon it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've always got that that side of me that's a little bit hesitant to believe everything. But, you know, I do think when Alex came on and what he spoke about, he never made any promises, but he certainly, you know, spoke about a lot of things that he's considering, the, the plans for the future, and and very much wanted everybody involved in that as well. Yeah, definitely. And, and it's something that, you know, we at Roker Report and everyone listening, because, you know, if you're listening to this podcast, you've got an interest in in Sunderland ladies um, we can all play our part in can't we we can all kind of bring a friend bring a relative down to the ground you know share pictures on social media I think we do need to kind of normalise uh, Sunderland women as as, as a core part of, of Sunderland AFC and as you say we've got we've got Wembley on, on Saturday and the outcome of that will be really important because the two, the, the, the fortunes of the two have always uh, risen and, and fallen together so let's really quickly talk about next season then Ant you you mentioned it that you'd be happy with a a kind of a mid-table finish finishing kind of sixth or seventh would mean one point around 1.5 points a game which is a big reasonably big jump from from just over a point a game this season I think in previous seasons it's been between 1.2 and 1.5 a game so 
what do you think of of kind of that target and do you think we'll be able to uh we'll be able to achieve a kind of maybe a, a six or seven place finish yeah i mean like, like i said before i think we do we do need a striker like an out and out striker um mm. just someone who's going to get you what 10 to 15 goals a season you know you look at you look at abby harrison for, for bristol i mean she was phenomenal, but she, she she guarantees you ten goals, doesn't she? You know, um, mm-hmm. you look you look at our our neighbours up the road. You know, they've they've got players who are scoring you know seven eight goals, and and all assigned uh, Rio Hardy to you know to bang them a few goals in, which hasn't quite worked out. But um, we probably yeah, you, we definitely need a striker. I think we probably need to look at another centre half, maybe two, just in case you know there is an injury. Um, at the minute we've we've only got Grace McCarty because obviously Abby Towers has suffered a. Uh, and an yeah. injury, and um, we hope that she's going to be back at some point next season. I know uh, talking to her dad, who have uh, great know you know really well, he's quite confident that she'll be back for, to play some part of the season. But you know, you you need someone else to play with Grace. You know, we can't just rely on Neve to go back there because it just for me it just ruins it ruins Neve's ability for us in midfield. And and I think yeah. I do always think that when she doesn't play there, we miss her. Depending on who goes and who stays, you know, we still don't know who's staying and who's going. You know, do we look at maybe bringing in another winger? To be honest, it it probably just needs two or three. It just needs a couple of tweaks, you know, because what I'm more what more looking forward to than never who we're going to bring in is seeing the likes of Gracie next year, who's had you know a season under a belt, who looks the part. You know, she she just every inch of her looks a very good footballer. You know, the likes of Katie Watson, if she's um, you know, if she stays at the she doesn't go in the twenty threes, you know, she's she banged her first ever career goal for us at the age of sixteen, you know, so she's obviously got something. You know, these girls who can come up and, and do the part and you know, there's a couple in the RTC at the minute, you know, I'll I'll mention Emily Kassap for this because she's gonna be phenomenal. Um, you know, she's only what, I think she's just turned fifteen, so it might be a little bit too early for her next season. But she's gonna be a hell of a player, you know. But more and more I think it's just the, the experience of this year will stand them all in massive stead for next year. You know, bring a couple in, and then we'll we'll, we'll the sky's the limit, really, Rich. The sky's the limit. Yeah, I think I think you're right. I think we need maybe a couple coming in from the outside, more experienced players. I mean, just saw talking of 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 the kind of level of defender you might need to get further up the league. Um, Satara Murray, who played against us for Bristol City, just gone to racing Louisville in the um, NWSL. So that's the standard of player that's yeah, at the top was, of the championship. Phenomenal. And she was class. Phenomenal player. I mean, she was really, she really, really stood out as a, as an excellent footballer. Totten maybe transfers really quickly, Charlotte. Um, what do you, where do you think we need to kind of maybe strengthen uh, over the summer? Yeah, I mean, kind of what Ant talked about there is we've got a really good core team, but we just really need that additional depth. I mean, I think we definitely need to have an out and out striker. You know, somebody who we know is you know, going to be getting in there, getting some shots on goal, because that, that has definitely been our weak point. You know, when I've been looking through Y Scout, we constantly are having shots maybe on um on goal, but whether they're actually on target and, you know, obviously coming through to be a goal is another thing. So having somebody, I know we always talk about, like Bridget Galloway would be absolutely excellent. Mm-hmm. And, you know, she scores goals for us, that's mm-hmm. for sure. Uh, but I definitely think having sort of that out and out striker, um, another defender, you know, preferably somebody who's quite experienced because it is a very difficult position to play as a centre back. Um, although saying that, you know, we saw how well um the likes of Abby Towers slotted in there. Um, but just sort of like what Anne said, I mean, um, Neve is so competent in playing in centre back, but you really lose her attributes um in sort of contributing to the attack. Um, you know, we we spoke about the the game against Sheffield and those through balls that she can play in long balls over the top that create those opportunities we would we would lose that yeah. um so i think adding definitely somebody at center back to, um, with grace mccarty up front and then just maybe just some additional depth um out on the wings really yeah it's going to be really interesting and exciting summer and it's been a really interesting discussion with with you two actually just to kind of to to sum it all up uh, you know we've talked at length over the over the course of the season on the twitter spaces and just to kind of get that that big overview uh, is great so so thanks to you both for 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 your input into this um this inaugural podcast so we have uh, an exclusive interview with former Sunderland defender WPL double winner 
Gemma Wilson that should be with you in the next couple of days on on this feed on the on the Roker Rapport podcast feed there's going to be loads of uh, content as well I think we've got an exclusive interview with Max Power coming up which might be with you either simultaneously with this or shortly after you're listening to this um, there's also the Simon O'Rourke interview that was released on on Monday and maybe we might have one or two extra little bits we'll see for your trip down to Wembley and the way back up victorious way back up I'm sure at the end at the end of this weekend on the website we've got Charlotte's profiles and interviews with Kira Ramshaw Grace McCatty Alison Cowling and Emily Hutchinson who we shouldn't forget has been still still with the club. Um, she's been out injured for a long time, but there's a lovely interview um, that that Charlotte's done with her and, and her profile. And Ant, you've got your season review coming up on Rugby Report Two this week, haven't you? <laughs> Eventually. Eventually. <laughs> it's it's yeah, it's it's halfway there. Well, half it's quite detailed, so it's, it's halfway there. We'll, we'll hopefully get up for next week. Yes, yeah, so really looking forward to reading that. And there's always loads of stuff on the Rook Report website for some of the FC women fans. We've also got our brand new social media channels uh, on Twitter, on TikTok, on Instagram. And we've got a Discord and a Telegram channel as well. And you can find out all the details about them on the link tree link that's in the description to this pod. And I'll leave you with a wonderful track, Science from Big Fat Big. And all that's left for me to say is thanks to you, Ant. Thank you. Cheers. And thanks, Sean. Thank you very much. And we'll speak to you all soon. I wear the lads and I wear the lasses.